Now let me give you a couple of examples um, from my own research. Now the next few graphs I'm going to show you are um, an analysis of um, about six and a half million tweets that uh, that we gathered on Twitter, and we were looking at substance use. In this case, um, dangerous drinking or binge drinking. Binge drinking continues to be a problem in the United States, with somewhere between five and fifteen percent of Americans reporting that they've binge uh, that, that they have engaged in binge drinking during the past month and uh, results in billions and billions of dollars annually continues to be a, a problem. Now we were interested in measuring social norms on, on Twitter of all places. And, and why would we be interested? Well, because we believe that um, by virtue of the social dynamic on Twitter, if you follow somebody, that person could be considered your referent by which you may be making your own evaluations about your future behavior based upon what they're tweeting about. So for example, if a friend of yours is tweeting about alcohol use, um, not just alcohol use, but dangerous or, or, or problem drinking. So he says something like, I was so drunk that I couldn't get home last night. Well, in as much as he is your referent, by which you're evaluating your own future behavior, you may say something like, wow, if he engages in that behavior, perhaps there's an expectation that I too engage in the behavior, or if not an expectation, a social acceptance. So what we found here, and, and again, this is 6.5 million tweets across um, uh, nine different states uh, throughout the United States, so fairly representative population of the United States, um, what we found is that references toward um, alcohol or problem drinking tweets were very common from the hours of about 10 or 11 p.m. till about 1 in the morning. Now, that's what you'd expect. And, and so, on the one hand, this is really nice because it shows what we expect. And an expectation is a social norm. So, in fact, what we're seeing is that millions and millions of people are saying, yes, in fact, if you're going to go get drunk and risky, not just drunk, but, but binge drink and do so in a dangerous way, yeah, you do it at night. Probably when people are partying. And there's, in their, the next graphs will, will confirm that that's probably what's happening. Um, is right here, we're showing that it's day of the week. So we're saying uh, that most people are, getting, uh, are binge drinking on, uh, on the weekends. Well, that confirms an expectation. The, 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 I guess the added value of this or the difficulty is that now we're showing that a nation believes this. So now if you're an adolescent and you're formulating your own perceptions and your own attitudes about drinking, well, should I binge drink? Well, if millions and millions of people are reporting and saying that yes, you binge drink. Binge drink on weekends. It's normal. It's normal to go to a party and to get smashed. And uh, this is just an interesting comparison, kind of for fun, that shows um, New Year's Eve compared to um, the same days during the uh, dur during October. And and so this further uh, drives home the point that I was just saying that. Not only do they think that you should drink on weekends, but they believe that on holidays, traditional drinking holidays such as New Year's, it's okay. Everybody's doing it. Get drunk, binge drink, uh, because we're all doing it, and it's okay. It's socially acceptable. No one will think you're bad or evil for doing it. And this is just showing again by time of day, comparing New Year's with, with October. Now this next graph here, or this table, represents the results from a study that we did recently in Utah County uh, in conjunction with the County Health Department who was interested in learning more about texting and driving among Hispanic adolescents. And so we went into all the high schools in, um, in Utah County and we surveyed the Hispanic Latino adolescents and we were curious about factors that contribute to texting and driving, and we used the theory of planned behavior as our theoretical framework and identified that um, 
these, these specific items were most important or most predictive of them avoiding texting and driving. Their confidence in their ability to avoid texting and driving. And you might say, well, of course, it would be easy to avoid texting and driving. Well, put yourself in the circumstances or in the situation of a high school student. And somebody sends you a text and you're driving. Is there an expectation to respond and do so quickly? And in fact, what we found anecdotally from many students was they said things like, if I don't respond right away, my boyfriend or my girlfriend or my friends will want to know where I'm at, what I'm doing, and they'll be angry. Why didn't you respond to me? Or, if I don't respond to my friends right away, then they might leave me. I might not get to go hang out with them. Time-sensitive issues. Um, so to the extent that they feel comfortable or confident that they could avoid texting and driving, I can put the phone over there and I don't need to touch it. I'm, I, I, I won't text again until the car is stopped. Now, so that represents perceived behavioral, uh, perceived behavioral control. Now, the next two represent the social norms. People who are important to me want me to avoid texting while driving. Parents, peers, teachers. My friends would criticize me for texting while driving a motor vehicle. Again, uh, uh, um, social norm, specifically a normative belief. And attitudes. So each of those things was found to be very relevant and very predictive of avoiding texting and driving among Hispanic adolescents. Now I'm going to go back real quick to an example of some research that we did here in the department, as I mentioned before and said I would come back to this, of um, social media use among health educators. So we measured behavioral beliefs, um, outcome evaluations, normative beliefs, control beliefs. Um, so here's how we measure behavioral beliefs. Now, um, you might ask yourself, well, why, why do we care if health educators are using social media? Um, well, we care because... Uh, a lot of information, especially about emerging infections and things, are not uh, sometimes not found in referen traditional reference um, uh, texts or areas. Meaning, uh, I, as a health educator, um, when well, here's the perfect example: when swine flu was was emerging, um, I couldn't, I didn't have a reference text in my library you know, an encyclopedia that I could look at. So I had to find that information online. Um, and perhaps with um, a another area where we've seen this frequently is with spice. So spice is a synthetic, um, basically synthetic uh, marijuana. Well, many health educators in Utah may not be aware of it. So they might communicate with their colleagues in, um, in California or somewhere else that might have more experience with it. It might also be true within Utah. Health educators in rural areas may have less experience than health educators in urban areas. And so to the extent that we're communicating uh, through social media, I'm able to learn more about these things and, and improve my, my, myself as a health educator. So we looked at behavioral beliefs. So again, this is the connection between the behavior and the outcome. I would find social media tools useful in my job. Using social media tools would enable me to accomplish tasks more quickly. Using social media tools would increase my productivity. If I use social media tools, I will increase my chances of getting a raise. So these are all things that, that we measured. Normative beliefs. People who influence my behavior think that I should use social media tools for work-related purposes. Now, who might those people be? Bosses, colleagues. People who are important to me think that I should use social media tools for work-related purposes. The senior management of my organization has been helpful in the use of, uh, in the use of social media tools for work-related purposes. And in general, my organization is supportive for the, in, of the use of social media tools for work-related purposes. Uh, and here's how we measure behavioral intentions. I intend to use social media tools in my job. I predict I would use social media tools. I plan to use social media tools. Behavioral control. My use of social media tools would be voluntary as opposed to required by, superior, uh, by, by supervisors. Social media tools are currently used in my organization. 
Does your employer monitor or block access to social media sites at work? So let's say, for example, you believe that using social media would improve your efficacy as a health educator. And your colleagues around the country or around the state or around the city think that you should be using social media because that's, that, that, that's where most information is and you'd be much more efficient or effective. But let's say, for example, you work at a health department and uh, they've blocked social media sites such as Facebook or MySpace or, or, or maybe even just blogs and other things. Given the resources, opportunities, and knowledge it takes to use social media, it would be easy for me to use social media tools. So, for example, I don't have any experience using Facebook. So, it would be difficult for me to go learn how to use it and, and, and for me to use it. I don't even use a computer that often. Um, and so it might be difficult for me. By contrast, I use a computer very often. I Facebook with my friends for other things. It would be very easy for me to start using Facebook for, uh, for um, work-related purposes and communicating with other health educators. And here are the results that we found. Um, and, and essentially we found that all of these things are very predictive of, of, of uh, using social media at work, including the social influence, um, the normative beliefs, behavioral outcomes, um, and, and all of those things being very, very relevant, very predictive, and, and you can note that significance or predictiveness by looking at the third column from the right-hand side where it says significant, and those that are less than 0.05 would be very significant predictors.